thing. But I just want to do a quick whip, whip round. I know it's uh, one or two new faces, so I think it'll be a good idea just to just to go round and, and everyone to introduce themselves. So um, I'll start and we'll go that way. Uh, my name is Alex Anderson and I am the councillor for Stamford East and Corringham Town. And I am Councillor Graham Snell, councillor for Corringham and Fobbing. Uh, councillor Tom Kelly, councillor for uh, Little Farrock Rectory Ward. Councillor Lee Watson, I'm West Farrock, South Sifford on Perfleet on Thames, councillor. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Martin Kerrin, representing Grays Riverside Ward, where we're all sitting currently. And can I just say, uh, welcome you to the Chair as your first meeting of the municipal year and say um, congratulations to you. I um, obviously want to welcome my friend and comrade, Councillor Lee Watson, and also say welcome back, Councillor Snell. The other two you've been here before, so. <laughs> Testing over there, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Councillor David Van Day, uh, Averley Uplands uh, and Averley and Uplands and Kennington's. Ward. Turn off. Uh, piece of right, uh, strategic lead, highways infrastructure. Rebecca Ellsmore, strategic lead for regeneration. Good evening, members. Kenna Healy, Democratic Services. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kerrin, for uh, your warm words. Um, before we go into uh, apologies for absence, we are having a couple of technical issues. I'm going to pass it over to Kenna just um, to explain those to members because it will affect this evening's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, unfortunately, we're having trouble with getting the screens in the chamber to work which means that those officers that would have joined us via um, Teams unfortunately can't be with us. Therefore, that there are items 9 and 10 this evening. Um, unfortunately, we can't have the presenting officer with us. So if members are happy, um, I would suggest that we perhaps defer those items to the next meeting or if obviously if yourselves and the chair were happy to, you could look at having an extraordinary meeting to hear those items. Um, Everything was working up until about 45 minutes ago. We ran the test, everything was absolutely fine. And unfortunately, for some reason, they've just gone blank and we can't figure out what's going on. So I do apologise for that, Chair. So um, what, what that means is that as well as not being able to see officers, uh, they, we won't be able to hear them either, so we can't ask them questions. Um, as such, I, I would suggest that those two items are deferred and I will look at possibly holding an extraordinary meeting um, so that we can um, look at those items quicker than the October meeting, which is our, our next scheduled. Are members happy with that? Mm. Fantastic. So we'll move on to the actual agenda. First item is apologies for absence. Uh, I've not received any conceal. All, all members are present. Um, I would not. No, no apologies. Um, the next item is to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Are we all uh, in agreement to, to approve those? Yes. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, items of urgent business is agenda item three. I've not received any items of urgent business. Uh, fourth item, declaration of interest. Does anyone have any interest to declare? No, fantastic. So we will move on to the first report of the evening, item five, and this is the approval of naming and numbering of streets and highway assets policy. Um, and is this uh, Pete? That, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, so this report sets out basically the formalisation of a long-standing practice that we've been doing with street name and numbering. There hasn't really been a, an, an agreed process or policy in place for the practice that we've had going on for many years, um, since I think the old environmental committees. So the report sets out and attached to it is the policy um, of how we go about doing the name and numbering. As an authority, we, we've got a, a statutory duty um, that we need to comply with, hence why the authority um, leads on this. Um, so we've been responsible for administering it for a good number of years, um, and then we work with Royal Mail um, to enable them to obviously do their deliveries, emergency services and so forth and so on. 
So and it ensures obviously an efficient delivery service um, and for businesses for their registrations and so forth. Um, as I say, it's a statutory obligation that we have to create an official, official address for every residential property and commercial property within the borough. Um, the policy sets out the process um, and how we go about and the criteria in which we do current naming and numbering of, of uh, businesses and streets and so forth. There's a fee charged to that, which is a statutory fee, which is in the fees and charges. Um, the slight change to what we're bringing into the policy now following representations from uh, members and members of the public is we're looking at um, allowing naming of uh, highways assets such as bridges going forward um, and potentially naming certain roads under certain situations and uh, after um, people um, deceased and so forth and the policy sets out around the criteria around that we try to word it so that um, there's there's uh, a rigid process to go through when naming it after a uh, deceased person because obviously there's histories sometimes that can be unveiled with respect to the person that it's named after and and there's a process in which it goes to so it comes through to the highways infrastructure team to manage gets referred to ward members for comments um, and then it goes to the portfolio holder and then to cabinet to then approve um, and it's all contained in the policy I don't know if members have a question on it it's quite quite straightforward I'm hoping um, but I'm happy to take any questions on it Thank you for that, Pete. Uh, Councillor Kerrin. Yeah, no, thank you for this report. Just, um, I, was, I was wondering if there's any scope for a future roads and um, things being named after people involved with the um, COVID response and NHS heroes who have um, sort of, you know, contributed in Thurrock and if there's a, a process whereby, you know, we could honour some of the people who got us through, well, I know we're still in the pandemic, but when we come to the end of it, we could maybe honour some of the sort of brave men and, and women who who got us through it just a, a comment and a suggestion chair um it can certainly be considered it would need to go through the the application process but um there's there's a, a nervousness around naming after um people who are having deceased because it's you don't know how their life play out yeah so this is it so you, you know you once once you name something after someone to then change the name um a name of a street at a later date it's it's not that straightforward because it's registered with royal mill people have their business papers drawn up yeah. and so forth and so on so i would the mechanism allows it to be done um potentially after someone that's not deceased but it, we would need to be extremely cautious about how we go down that and it needs to go through the, the sign off process so Correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, but I, th I think I read in there that with residential streets as well, if you are to rename a street, everyone on the street has to be in agreement. Now, obviously, if, if a street were to be renamed um, after someone who, um, you know, uh, was later found to have been unsavoury in some kind of way, um, you, you'd need the agreement of every, every household on the street to then change that. So I can understand why, why there's some hesitancy around that. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> in, we've got a load of new developments coming through that have got no street names at all. So if we can s think about putting that onto the list for the new developments, I don't see why there will be a problem if you've already named a street before people can move in on it. So can we take that into a bit of consideration on a, like a list of names of the new developments that will be coming through? Um, I'm happy if people have suggestions, then we can take forward them suggestions and they can obviously be put in the mix. So, yeah, I'm happy to take forward any suggestions. So. Thank you, Pete. Are there any other questions uh, on this item? Doesn't look like it. Well, I'm going to move on to the recommendation then. Just the one for uh, this report. 1.1 uh, can be found on page 15. Are members in agreement? Agree. Agree. Fantastic. We'll move on to... Uh, Item number six, uh, this can be found on pages 37 to 42, and it's the Highway Street Lighting Central Management System, and I shall hand over to Pete again. Thank you again, Chair. So, so yeah, so this report's um, just seeking approval to um, go out to tender um, for the procurement of a, a central management system for street lighting. Um, in we... The Highway Team won uh, an internal capital bid as part of the 2021-22 uh, 
um, capital programme um, with a view to installing the system um, which will allow us to remotely monitor our traffic signals um, and build in greater efficiencies in, in which it, we, we, we do it. Um, we currently manage over 21,000 street lighting assets, um, which we haven't got visibility of um, remotely. Um, so this allows us to have that dynamic, dynamic control in real time. Um, as part of the bid as well, we then need to install some uh, base stations, which allows us to have the coverage around the borough to pick up each of the individual assets. Uh, there's some real um, great savings um, in, to, be, to be obtained from this, um, not just financials, but in CO2 savings, because um, it reduces um, travel time. It um, enables us uh, to, to get real-time information with respects to um, before members of the public make complaints or raise issues around um, the street lighting assets. For instance, last year we received over uh, 680 inquiries relating to street lighting assets alone, um, and we raised uh, over 900 maintenance faults tickets, and a lot of them would have been raised off the back of the 600 and, uh, 680 inquiries we've received. What this will enable us to do is, is to get the tickets raised and hopefully rectified before the residents even see that there's an issue with their street lighting assets. Um, some of the predicted savings we can get, you know, it's, um, I don't know if you how, how you can visualise it, but we're, we're talking potentially annually of up to uh, 1,500 tonnes of CO2 savings, um, which, which equates to uh, 1,000 cars off the road over, over a 20-year lifespan. Um, we're also potentially uh, going to be able to save 125 grand a year um, in financial savings. And these, these are around um, how we can stop day burning activities going on with street lights. Um, it saves uh, misreporting. So we, we, when we go out to the fault, we generally will know what the fault is real time and we can raise it without, without having to attend it first time. Um, and it also allows us to manage customer expectations better going forward because we can hopefully be a lot more um, quicker and responsive to dealing with customer inquiries and stuff like that. The report sets out the timetable for it. Um, we're hope hopefully going to go out to tender um, in September with a view to um, the contract starting on the 1st of January. We predict it would take six months from start to finish um, to because we've got to finish, uh, visit every single street lighting asset. Um, and then we have to obviously map that back to a base station to enable us then to, to monitor them remotely. Um, so the recommendation is uh, in section four, which is, is basically for uh, the procurement of the CMS system. Um, and that's it, Chair. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Pete. Um, just a really quick, simple one from me. It's a short report and it's very positive. It talks about the disbenefits of not um, obtaining the system um, and it, it talks about the benefits of the system, are there any uh, disadvantages or disbenefits that do come along with this system at all? If, if there isn't, and it's all positive, fantastic, but I just wondered if, if there were. Um, from a personal point of view, no, I think it's, it's, it's a system that's long overdue in the borough, to be quite honest. It's, it's a system a lot of authorities already have, um, and Essex County Council have it, numerous um, highways authorities have it, and it's, it's really it's just part of the progression now with regards to highways management, asset management, giving us that information real time so we can be on it before members of the public see it, um, and the efficiencies you can get out of it, it's, you know, it's revolutionary really, so it's, as a platform, it's, it's long overdue, um, and it's, you know, it's, I, I, I can't really see any uh, disbenefits personally, um, but I'm bound to say that because I'm, I'm presenting the report, but in all honesty, um, no, I think it's, it's, it's the system that's long overdue for the borough, so. Councillor Kerrin. Thank you very much for the report. It's um, more of a sort of question about the tendering, really, more than anything. Um, is there a, re a reason why we couldn't do this in-house rather than getting an outside contractor? It's a specialist piece of software, um, so uh, it's it's not we wouldn't have capabilities with our own ICT department. It's there's only a few providers on the, on the market that provide this um, 
I've, I'm not aware of any other authority that, that's, that's managed it in-house. There's, there's specialist companies out there that, that do this bit of kit. Um, and for us to do it in-house, I, I think the cost would be astronomical because we don't have the skill set, don't have the equipment to do it. Um, it'd be lovely to. Um, we can manage it. When we get the system, we will manage it. But unfortunately, we need that technical expertise to, in, to implement the system for us. Are there um, any other questions, Councillor Kelly? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, just very briefly, um, so you're saying it's around about £25,000 a year. I assume that's, that's, that sounds cheap, so that's, I assume that's just the software running in the background, and then you guys get the report and then go out and, and, and fix it. And then in addition to that, sorry, just two quick questions. There is a cost associated with setting this up via a capital bid of around about a million, roughly. Thank you. Um, yeah, so first, first of all, yes, there's the capital bid that we won, which was around a million to, to install the software, um, to install the, uh, the nodes and so forth on each other, street lighting assets. Um, but then the savings you generate would then repay that initial outlay. Um, the 20, it's about 25 grand a year. Um, from what we've, we've done some market testing, spoken to some providers, and, and for the higher, well, it's, it's like the license agreement, as you say, for the software that allows us to do it. So it's basically a, a, a platform that we can log on to remotely in a cloud and officers can go in there and they run the reports. It's, it's our own street lighting team that go up there, turn the computer on in the morning and they'll see um, halfway road, column nine out. And then they can then just raise a ticket there and then for that column rather than waiting for a, a customer inquiry to come on or a street lighting scout to go out and identify it. Um, it's, it's really as simple as that. Um, I'm happy once the system's in place to, to give a demonstration on it because, you know, it is, it is a good, good bit of kit. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's as simple as it sounds. Councillor, do you want to come back? No. Okay, I can't see any other hands up. So we will go to the recommendation that can be found on page 37, 1.1. Again, I won't, I won't read it out. I'll just ask a members in agreement. Agreed. Fantastic. So we'll move on to item seven now. This is the Greys South delivering the pedestrian underpass project progress, and it can be found on page 43. Uh, Rebecca, oh, wait. fantastic. Thanks, Chair. So there are two items on um, this agenda relating to Greys. This is the first one, the project progress one. The second one deals with a specific set of legal requirements around CPO. It might be sensible, Chair, if we present both the reports and then take questions at the end because they're so interlinked, if that's okay? Okay. So the first one is about project progress. Um, so members will be aware that there's a budget set by Cabinet in um, 2017 of 27.4 million for the Greys underpass scheme. And that encompasses the underpass itself, the steps and ramps to get people into and out of the underpass and the public realm that wraps around that. In July 2020, we presented to Cabinet that we were forecasting that we would exceed that budget and proposed that the budget might go up to an estimate of 37.9 million. And that was based on having much better information at that stage than we did in 2017 and knowing a lot more about the site. We proposed at that point that we would come back once we got to the end of grip stage three, which is network rail parlance for um, single option selection, when we'd have a further iteration of the cost plan, and this report is that output of the cost plan. And so where we've got to in the interim, we're still working on option C, which was selected by Cabinet as the preferred option in 2020. We have had some savings shown in the network rail element of the cost plan, but we have to be cautious that some of those savings have reallocated the cost into the council responsible element. So the total budget at the moment that we're predicting is 37.3 million, a slight improvement on where we were last year, but still obviously in excess of the, the previous budget. There are still some risks attached to this budget. Um, programme is one of them. It's very much a function of land assembly, which obviously is linked to third parties and to a certain extent outside the council's control. It's also got estimates in there for utilities, which we haven't yet been able to test with utilities providers because we needed to get the design to this level of information before we can go out and really test that with the providers. So that's very much on the, the next steps list. And it's not a tendered scheme yet, so we do have to be aware that market forces will be at play at the point that we do tender the contract. 
However, we have allocated contingency against all these items and we are still looking to drive efficiency by looking at value engineering options, um, pushing Network Rail on their fees and asking Network Rail and C2C, who are both, of course, beneficiaries of the scheme, to look to see if they can contribute any further. Um, the next steps are outlined in the report. We are looking for the cost plan to be endorsed as, as where we are at this particular point in time. We are looking to enter into the next contract with Network Rail to do that next stage of design work. There'll be further cost plans coming out um, throughout the process. And then we also reference linking to the CPO, which is item eight on the agenda. So item eight is very much about the land assembly for the scheme. We've kept it separate from the project update because it is very much focused on very specific legal requirements um, that you need to be aware of when we're entering into a CPO. The aim is always still to try and acquire the site by private treaty without the use of compulsory purchase powers. But what compulsory purchase will do will put a framework around these discussions and give us the best chance of achieving the assembly of the site within the time frames that are required. So the report goes through eight elements, really, that the decision makers will need to be aware of at the point of, um, of entering into the decision to make a CPO. They're set out in... Um, Section three, I won't go through them all because they are <laughs> quite involved. Um, but if, if there's any specific questions, we can take those. But the heart of it really is about members needing to be reassured that the scheme is deliverable, that there is a public benefit for the scheme. And actually, by pursuing a CPO, we are not disproportionately affecting any human rights or having a negative impact on the qualities. So officers are of the view that all those tests are have been met and we're ready to propose that a CPO is um, pursued for the scheme. So all that is in the report. Um, there is a note on the qualities impact assessment that we have got to always be clear on this scheme that safety and accessibility are paramount. They could be very easily got wrong, so they're always at the forefront of our minds to make sure that the underpass is a self -wake welcoming, safe, welcoming and attractive space to be. Um, and the recommendation is to, to pursue the CPO to make sure we can acquire the site. Thank you for introducing and speaking on those two reports, Rebecca. Um, a quick question from myself. The, this is referencing the first report. Um, I, I recall back in July of last year, we had a report on the underpass come to committee. And I can't remember it exactly verbatim, but I'm sure um, that that report mentioned, it, it referenced uh, an application for the town fund it, it specified a, a, a towns fund application. This report simply says that um, the, the, the towns fund is being explored. W where are we with that? Because it, it just seems there's a bit of a discrepancy between the language there. So uh, have we made an application? If so, w where are we at? Yep, so an application was made to the towns fund and we had to submit a towns investment plan to access that funding. Um, there was an element in there which was referred to as station gateway connectivity, which may help support the underpass budget. The decision for the town fund is resting with government at the moment. We were expecting an announcement in May, and then we were expecting an announcement in June, and we're now expecting an announcement in July. It's quite understandable the government's got a lot on its plate right now, it's fair to say. So hopefully we'll get some positive news on that, and then we can look at how that interplays with the underpass. There is a chance, though, on the towns fund that we won't get everything we've asked for. We've seen a lot of towns get reduced allocations, so when we get that allocation, we'll have to see where it's best directed. Thank you for that. Um, I will open up to uh, members. No. Councillor Kerrin. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for this report. But obviously, I think it's my third or fourth year on this committee, and I must admit I am worried by the jump in budget because um, I just have... A13 and Stanford flashing at me. And um, even within the total cost of between 34.9 to 37.9, we're still looking at 3 million difference just for that. Um, and then for, throughout the report, there's a lot of, you know, we may do this, we're exploring this. Um, I'm, I'm just worried about the deliverability of it. And I'm just sort of looking for further sort of assurance with that, because even... I'm thinking like, with the Towns Fund, um, even if we were successful with, with that, we, you know, we, I think the headline figure is you know, 25 million or something. And 
with, with the amount of things that are being put together for it, that 25 million isn't going to cover the underpass, the redevelopment of the riverside. I mean, I think the, the college opposite was 20 some, was in the 20s of millions when that was built, and that's just one building. So forgive me, but I, I do have um, concerns about it being delivered and that we're, you know, we're going to be back here you know, if we get rejected by the town's fund, or if we do, ultimately, it's still, I could see us being back here again next year saying, oh, sorry, guys, it's up to, it's up to this now. And I just wondered how confident you are, 100% confident that it's going, this one's going to work. We're as confident as we can be at this particular stage in the scheme. You know, the scheme hasn't got planning consent yet. We haven't got a contractor lined up yet. So there are risks still on the scheme. There is no getting away from that. We think we've put in enough contingency to cover those risks, and we think we've identified ways that there are value engineering opportunities should they be needed. What we haven't compromised on at the moment is the environment that we're trying to create in, in Grays Town Centre. There's, there's no question that there's a cheaper underpass that can be delivered out there, but that's not what Graves Town Centre needs from a placemaking point of view. So we very much kept the quality and the scale of it in the scheme at the moment, and that requires further budget. This is the most robust cost plan we've ever had on this scheme because we've got that extra level of design. Um, the utilities is a risk, but hopefully we'll be able to get and speak to the utility providers. Now we've got to this point and that'll start to knock that off. All we can do is keep knocking the risks off and then making sure we look at the contingency and either keep it in if we still need it or take it out and present a, a more efficient budget if we don't need it. Thank you. Um, with that risk in, in mind, um, I'm looking at um, paragraph 3.2.1 and I, I'm not really convinced about um, delegating sort of further decisions to the um, you know, the corporate directors and the portfolio holder. I, I think there should be more sort of openness and scrutiny at every stage of this. And even within this committee, I think we, regardless of our views on the aforementioned projects, I mentioned, you know, the A13 and Stanford, we all agreed that it needs to be coming back to committee more regularly. And I, um, I'm worried that this, um, that 3.2.1 will lead to um, less accountability with a project that to get it right needs to be in the open because of sort of past experiences. I just wondered if you, if you had any thoughts on that. So the request to delegate the procurement of the next stage is very much because we are discussing with Network Rail. So at the moment, the design is led by Network Rail's capital delivery team and it's delivered through that route because they are the experts in delivering infrastructure in and around the railway. Um, it's much easier to have them inside the fence than outside and then try and get approvals from them. There's two ways that we can procure that next stage with them. We can either do an isolated um, procurement for GRIP 4, which is the detailed design, or we can do a, a procurement for GRIPs 4 to 8. We're talking to them about the best way to do it. We may not necessarily agree with them on what the best way is, but we need to work out what those benefits and disadvantages are. The cost plan at the moment is based on entering into a contract with them, whichever way we go, in November. So time is very much of the essence to have those discussions. What we don't want to do is take a long time to have those discussions and then just load cost onto the scheme because we haven't been able to act swiftly. Um, the actual procurement of the contractor, where the big bulk of cost will be, will be a bit further down the line, and that will require a cabinet decision in its own right, so that will come back to overview and scrutiny. Um, but I'd very much hope we can get this GRIP 4 or GRIP 4 to 8 contract out to Network Rail in the, the coming months. Um, just more of my ward hat on, really, because when, when I sort of look at the map, um, I think it's jumping between the two reports, it's the, the land one now, and when, when I'm looking on the map on page 67, um, I, I just took a little walk down the high street before the meeting just to double-check that I thought these shops were what they are. And there's, there's a, I'm, I'm worried about the sort of the high street in terms of sort of more commercial businesses being, um, uh, being sort of knocked down basically, uh, especially after the, the businesses that have had to make way for the extension of the civic offices. And, you know, a lot of these businesses have been in the town centre for a long time. You know, Curtains Bay, um, Daymar Carpets, Cat, Pound City. Um, I just sort of wonder 
how, what's the process of sort of dealing with these people who are ultimately in my ward? And also about the, the general character of the high street, mo uh, you know, losing more sort of commercial businesses when the, the character of the high street has always been sort of commercial businesses looking down to the river. So we've tried to limit the red line as far as possible. A, a requirement of compulsory purchase is you only take what you absolutely need. So we've tried to make sure that we're, we're not looking at anything that we don't need. We do physically need to get access to these sites to demolish them to be able to build the infrastructure. That will, of course, create disruption in the high street and it will affect those particular businesses. Once the infrastructure's in, some of that space will come back as development plots, so there'll be an opportunity to have that commercial back onto the high street. And we're very keen to make sure that the high street stays as a high street. It doesn't get halfway down and stop. That is a later phase of the project, and we need to get the underpass in to release that plot back. We have engaged with all the people that are in the red line, so we've got our professional advisors, our Montague Evans, on this scheme, and they have written to um, the freeholders and started talking to the tenants. We've had a little bit of engagement. Of course, it's a very difficult time for those businesses at the moment, and it's been very hard to get hold of them during the pandemic. Indeed, we haven't really badgered them that much because quite clearly they've got other things on the mind and, and we didn't want to be seen as, as swooping in and taking advantage of the situation. So we're very much with kid gloves, but there has been engagement and there will continue to be engagement throughout the whole process. Even if we start a compulsory purchase, we don't stop talking to them. The aim is still to get private treaty agreements. And even if that's on the door of the inquiry, that's still the best result for everybody involved. There will be disruption, though. There's, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that there isn't. Thank you, Councillor Kerrin. Uh, Councillor Watson. Just um, a couple of bits from me, because I am, I'm not, I am new. I haven't been on here before. Um, so. The report to me feels really woolly and it also feels it's half-baked. I mean, you're, from 2017 to now, we've now got another 10 million on the cost on top of what was originally agreed. And also in 3.6, you're talking about an impact of this plan can be found in paragraph 2.16 to 2.25, which it doesn't even go up that far. So as members, we're, we're unable to see that cost plan. Um, the other thing, I think that everything is may, maybe, not sure, where you're asking us to make decisions that we need to be more factual on, and that in the long term, I agree with, with my colleague that we've already been burnt with um, the Orsic Cop and the Stamford Station. We can't afford to go down that road again, and it feels like it may end up going down that road a little bit. In terms of the CPO and the costs, um, it's at 6 million, or 6.7 million now. If there's an additional 18 months put on, what does that do in terms of the cost of construction costs as well as land assembly costs between now, which you've put on, to 18 months down the line? Is there a project projection on that at all? So we just probably need, for, me, for my benefit, um, maybe... I don't know about my rest of my colleagues, but we need a more holistic and straightforward approach of what, how this funding, how much it's going to be. Just uh, briefly there, Councillor Watson, uh, you mentioned um, the 3.6, how it, how it mentions um, paragraphs 2.16 to, to 2.25. I think that's a typo, um, because if, if you... Um, if you look, that says 2.16, and there is a, a, a cost and, and budget efficiency section that starts at 3.16. I, I think that's probably what the report is supposed to be referring to, and there's, there's a typo there, but I did notice that. And Sorry, where's the cost? It's just that one paragraph. It's just that one paragraph. It's, I can't, I don't know. That's why we didn't think it could be, because yeah. it wouldn't just be one paragraph. Sorry, so it's between 2.16 and 2.25? So, so where's, so where's the cost analysis on here? Yeah, apologies, it, it is a typo. It's, it should read 316 to 325, and it's those paragraphs collectively which talk about how we're trying to drive efficiencies. So it's the cost mitigation plan, not the cost plan itself. 
apologies. I, I did spot there was that typo um, earlier and I meant to raise it in my, my presentation, but sorry, I missed that one. So the cost of 316, the public benefit cost, that's not the breakdown of the costs of what you're saying is construction. No, so it's the other report. Cost. So 316 is on public benefit is on item 8. So if you click to the item 7, and then it's 316 to 325 there, it's an item 7 reference. So it starts off with driving cost and budget efficiency. I think I was more looking for the costs around construction costs and um, like feasibility costs and land assembly search costs, that sort of costs, more than I am about reducing risk of premature death costs. Yeah, so sorry, we haven't presented a full budget breakdown. We do have that information in, in which buckets it, it's, um, it sits against. It's, it's an interesting challenge on the, the wooliness of the report, and I think we're trying to tread a fine balance between if we waited to present you a full set of defined figures, we wouldn't be talking to you now. It'd be much further down the future, and we would have done a lot more work, and you wouldn't be able to have the debate about whether we're heading in the right direction. So it's an interesting challenge back to us of, of what point do we actually come and give you some of this information because these costs will have risks attached to them and they will have um, kind of estimates attached to them for quite some time yet. So we wouldn't be able to say this is absolutely the cost. We can say this is the cost based on this set of assumptions and taking into account these risks and, and where we see efficiencies can be made. It'll get more and more concrete as we get through the process. We still, I know it feels like we've been talking about this scheme for a long time, but we still are relatively early on in the design process. So our aim is that every time we come back to you, there's a little bit more certainty and there's less risks and less assumptions because we've really defined what the project is. But that's not where we are yet in the project life cycle. The land assembly and the programme impacts of course, there will there will at least be inflation, and I think we can all predict that that's going one way and not the other. It's difficult to really put a figure on it. So at the moment, the costs are based on when we expect to start on site. They're not based on, on what it would be if we started on site now. If land assembly adds 18 months onto the programme, then we'll have to look at that inflation again at that point. Um, but we're hoping that actually by having the framework of the compulsory purchase sitting around the land assembly acquisition discussions, we can start moving that process forward and it'll give us a better idea and it's another one of those elements of uncertainty that we can start to pin down a lot better. Okay, thank you. Councillor Snell. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for your report. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to bang on about the cost as well because it, I have to agree with uh, councillors Kerry and, um, and Watson. You've got £37.9 million pounds as a, a total figure there, but you say you've built in contingency. So what is the actual spades in the ground figure and what's the contingency part of that value? I think that's what we're trying to get at, really, because to me it seems like what we keep hearing again and again is that, well, we don't know the cost of this, and we don't know the cost of that, and we don't know the cost of the other. I mean, at the moment, there's only one direction this is heading in, and that's much, much, much higher budget. So, you know, at that 37.9, what is the spades in the ground figure of that, that proportion? So the spades in the ground also has quite a few elements to it. So there's the network rail elements where they're delivering the underpass and the steps and ramps. And that's broadly at about, and I'm not going to quote an exact figure because I haven't got it in front of me, but it's about 8 million of the 37. We've then got about 7 million pounds of land assembly, but there's other cost elements um, that also inform part of the scheme. So there's the public realm either side, there's the finishings of the underpass itself because we're, we're retaining control of that as a council rather than putting it with network rail, um, primarily because it'll be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> to not put too fine a point on it. But there's also things like we're trying to shorten the length of time people are in the underpass for. 
um, to make it a nicer environment, but that means we have to relocate Crown Road closer to the, um, to the train tracks to shorten that distance, so there's a cost element in there for that. We also need to relocate station approach, so we've got the space to get people down to the underpass level, so there's a cost element in there for that. Um, we, can, we can provide more information separately on, on what those all um, total up to as a, a cost for physical delivery versus a cost for fees, and then there's a cost for risk and contingency. There is a big contingency amount against network rail element. Um, I think we're at about 30% at the moment, and that's very much because of the, the Stanford and the A13 experience, and it's trying to be very clear that that's not a position that we want to get ourselves in at the, uh, you know, again. So the way to deal with that at the moment, where we are at this stage of the scheme, is to make sure that contingency is there. We could have taken some of that contingency out to try and bring the budget down, but that's clearly not the right approach because then we would be coming back in the future saying the cost has gone higher. So we've very much tried to make this a very robust cost plan, which takes into account the risks and allocates budget you know, for it, even though it creates difficult discussions like this one. Yeah, thank you for that answer. But it is still a little bit woolly. Now, I, th I think the problem we've got is that we're, we're going to be asked to delegate uh, the decisions to the Corporate Director of Resources and Place. And we're going to be out in trial. We've been asked to endorse the next steps in the programme. But the problem is we can't see what steps have been taken now. Uh, you explained them. That's great. Thank you very much for that. But we really do need to see these figures, really. Even if they're not at the stage, which yeah, we we will understand that they're not the final figures. We we will get that, but we do need to see where we are right now because it just seems to me that it's all a little bit vague. It's all, you know, I, I do I think it's going to come in at thirty-seven point nine right now without seeing any, any further detail. I'd say no, it's going to be a lot more expensive than that. Um, but I don't know. I, I might be wrong because I, I might look at the figures and oh yeah, I can, I can see this. I can see that. So you know, are we going to make a decision based on this information? I'm not happy to do that. I don't know about anybody else on the committee. Thank you. Do you want to respond? To we can provide a further breakdown, but it would obviously have to be after the committee now. I haven't got the information here in front of me to give that now. Councillor Kerrin. Yeah, just um, to sort of reiterate what um, Councillor Snell and Councillor Watson have all said, that for anything, any item, I'd, I'd rather have all as much information as possible. Send, you know, send, have three different folders worth. You know, as a councillor, it's my job to spend time looking through it, trying to understand it, coming prepped with the questions. And, you know, considering um, the magnitude of this item, we should all have more questions, but we can't really, because there's not enough to go on to ask those questions. And, I mean, I do note that this item is coming to Cabinet tomorrow and that it's actually an item which is not open to public and press yet i don't see any pink papers within this agenda so i'm just i'm, I'm thinking now what what information are we being denied as a committee and i think that's based on the fact it is tomorrow i mean the cabinet agenda tomorrow is huge and because um, i look ahead to it all and you know and it's it's th this particular item is is going to be pink paper you know closed to public and press I don't see anything in here which suggests that it should be closed to public and press, so what are we not being told is, is basically my question, Chair. Councillor Watson. I think that hearing everything that I've heard so far, we're not very happy with the level of the report and the decisions that we're up being asked to make. And also for us, I don't think, well, I probably know you haven't got the time as Chair to go back and report on what we feel now for Cabinet tomorrow night. And that's important because being a, a, a scrutiny, we need to have a voice in Cabinet. So I I either think that we need to put this on the work programme so we see it regularly, like we do everything else. We ask for the Cabinet to be deferred, the papers to be deferred, until we you have had the opportunity to take our back to Cabinet. Or we just don't agree these recommendations, and I don't know where that stands within Cabinet. Uh, do you have any further comments from anyone on the committee? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, I do think it's one that probably needs to come back more often. 
I mean, I'm not sure how often, but, but certainly, um, I would say, but at least once every six months, maybe, maybe even once every committee at this stage for that information. So that's certainly something I would, I would recommend. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see what other people think. Kenna? Thank you, Chair. Um, just obviously listening to members' discussions, it could be something, um, okay, when we get to the work programme, um, we'll go into a bit more detail as to obviously the items we'd like to see, and I was going to kind of bring up and um, advise members of the recent scrutiny review that was undertaken. Um, but as part of that, it does, um, from, the, sorry, from the scrutiny review, it did obviously say that there's, we're trying to have less two-note reports but obviously to use briefing notes more. So, for example, big projects like this, where you would like to have more information, maybe a bit more often than your meetings are spread out, you could perhaps ask that you have it on the work programme for a certain meeting, but between, say, for example, say you, we, I don't know, you, can't, you agreed the report, but you also agreed that you wanted it on the December meeting. Between now and December, you would like to have regular updates. So when there is something new, you get a briefing note on that and you know exactly what's going on and you're kept up to date as the project goes on. Um, it's just a thought and just an example. I don't know if that's helpful to members at all. Councillor Kerrin. I, I, I think um, that, that's a good idea in itself. Um, I'm, but just, just getting to the nuts and bolts of tonight, like I'm for, for recommendation 1.1a, I'm being asked to endorse the next steps of the programme, but I don't know if I'm 100% sure what the next steps are. Um, even C, you know, approve the latest of the cost plan, including paragraphs 3.8 to 9. Um, I'm just, it's, it's the information side of it, because I, I think, I'm not, I couldn't even say I disagree with where the project go, is going. I couldn't, I, I couldn't say I agree with where it's going either. I just I don't know, because of the, the sort of the, the information that's been presented. That's that. So I think going forward, great idea from democratic services, more information. That's, that's our job as members of the committee to have information all the time and to spend our time looking at the information and challenging officers and challenging each other on the committee. But I just think, you know, the amount, the amount involved in this project and between us, this is the, the questions we've been able to come up with. I, I, I don't know if, I'm, if I could sort of go ahead with the recommendations based on the information. Councillor Snell. Yeah, I, I mean, kind of alignment with uh, Councillor Karen on this one. Um, we, we can't um, agree uh, A and C. I mean, B is a different matter. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you know, uh, we would have to delegate those decisions anyway, I believe, because it, it makes sense. Um, but in terms of endorsing the next steps, well, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what they are. I think it's the right project and maybe we go in the right direction, but I'm not entirely sure. And, and absolutely, how can we approve the latest iteration of the cost plan when we don't really know what it is? So, um, I, I, you know, I think I couldn't endorse uh, points A and C, unfortunately. Are there any further comments from Councillor Kerry? No, so, you know, that's what we're here for, here for, Chair. I think with B, I think if, if we could... I, I don't, I'm not sure of the wording, but maybe edit it to put in there something about if we are going to delegate because you know like councillor snell said there you know um the actual professional officers do need scope and space to get on with it but is there something we could add about the level of feedback we get from it and, and the key points at which they report back to us so we so you know we, we're constantly kept uh, abreast as a, of a as a committee as to you know what what they're doing on our behalf yeah, but I think that feeds into um, a Democratic Services' point about um, briefing notes. It's certainly something that um, I'm keen to see between committees um, so that members uh, are kept uh, in the loop, as it were. Um, I mean, as it is tonight, what, what I would um, suggest is uh, the committee requests that um, that happens going forward, that we are given uh, regular briefing notes when... Um, that there are major updates or, or even minor updates. Um, and for the recommendations here tonight, we will go through them. And if members are in disagreement with some, then members in, are, are in disagreement. So unless there are any more questions on the re Rebecca. Sorry, can I just make a point about the pink papers? I think it is important that you know yeah. what it is that's not being shared here. So on the 
project update one, there's a there's a, a more detailed breakdown of costs. The reason why that's exempt from publication is because obviously we are in commercial discussions with Network Rail and there's some things that we wouldn't want to share with them that may then influence the fee proposals that they put to us. So that's why that's not public information. And then on the Land Assembly Compulsory Purchase one, there's a review of the discussions that we've had with the freeholders and the leaseholders and that contains information relative to their particular financial interests. So obviously we need to make Cabinet aware of what that is so they can do what you've just wanted to and understand that the costs have been adequately provided for, but it's not information that we would put into the public domain. So they're the only elements that are on pink papers and that's the reasons for it. Are there any further comments before? No? Okay. So we will move on to the recommendations and I will go to um, agenda item seven first. We will go through them individually. Uh, and so the committee is asked to comment on the recommendations below that will be put to Cabinet for approval. Recommendation A, endorse the next steps in the programme for the project. Any members in agreement? Okay, well then, that's for democratic services benefit. That's myself and Councillor Ker Kelly uh, in agreement. However, what I would say is, f for me, this is a, a sort of time is valuable sort of thing. We, 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 we've spoken about this at length and, and how time and, and delay can add cost, and so that is a, a, a real concern. But like Councillor Kelly says, there are obviously serious concerns with this report from members, including myself, I think, with... Just, just a note, I mean, is it possible, I mean, perhaps it might be more um, acceptable if we change the word endorse, and I know everybody hates this word, to note. If that word's changed, then I might be prepared to vote for that. So, if, that, if that's a, 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 an amendment to that first recommendation, then that needs to be put to the committee and read out by Democratic Services, doesn't it? Thank you, Chair. So just to confirm, we've had um, an amendment to recommendation um, A, so to change endorse the steps in the programme for the project to note the next step in the programme for the project. All those members in agreement? in the programme. All those members in agreement. Sorry, Chair, is there, oh, sorry to interrupt. Is there any way we could just add on to uh, the provisos that um, Kenna said about the extra information coming to us as a result of this, you know, with the briefing notes? I don't know if there's a, a, a form of word in which would do that, but I, I, I totally get the, the idea of, um, you know, the corporate director getting on with their day job, um, but just with the provise, you know, in, in the fewest amount of words possible, just a, about the the extra level of information we'll be getting as a result of it. So, re receiving updates. Yeah, when, like when basically, like you said, kind of in fewer words, I think. Uh, thank you, Chair. So you could perhaps on the end of that. Um, so uh, the procurement for the next contract set out on the program, full stop, and that overview and scrutiny receive regular briefing notes. Something to that effect. Do, do, you, do you need to read the full thing out, or, or are we okay I to can, vote? I can read it out in full if you want, but if you're happy with that, that wording, it'll be within the minutes. Yep. I can obviously. Yeah, it's connected to what said earlier, so it's within the minutes. Yeah. Yep, I'm, I'm happy with that wording. All those in agreement with that? Yep. Okay. So we'll move on to uh, recommendation C. Uh, which, as it stands, is approve the latest iteration of the cost plan, including paragraphs 3.8 and 3.9, and note the efforts made to continue to drive cost efficiency. 
All those members in agreement, please raise your hand. That's a unanimous disagreement, Kenna. So we will now move on to the recommendation for uh, agenda item eight, which can be found on page 53. Recommendation, I, I, I think I'll, I'll wait until Councillor Van Day has, has returned. I think he's just gone to use the bathroom. We're back, this is Councillor Van Day, and uh, we will return to recommendation 1.1 on page 54. It's a sole recommendation for uh, agenda item 8, uh, and it reads at the moment, overview and scrutiny, committee members are asked to endorse the approach to land assembly set out in the report in including the use of the council's powers of compulsory purchase and land appropriation. Councillor Kerry. Sorry, Chair. It's just, just a word endorse, because um, um, this is very specific to my ward, and I don't know if I endorse how the Council's going about the compulsory purchase until um, eventually those pink... Because uh, um, Rebecca explained the pink papers that are to do with um, uh, conversations that I've had with local business and that. And um, until I know sort of how the local businesses are being treated... I don't know if I can endorse it because local businesses could come to me as their ward councillor to help them if if they feel they weren't treated in a particular way by the council. So for me personally, I'd be much happier because I think we... It depends on the rest of the committee, but I'd be happy with no, like noting it because we have commented on it. But to endorse it, I, I, I could then end up having to sort of fight for a, a resident who owns a business there and... Do you see what I'm trying to say there, Chair? I don't know whether the rest of the committee will agree, but I thought I'd put it out there. Well, as it's um, uh, the recommendation on, on the page, 1.1 uh, is there as written, I'll put that to a vote, and then we can go from there, depending on... So, recommendation 1.1, page 54. Please raise your hand if you are in agreement with, pa with recommendation 1.1 on page 54. That's four. Oh. Those in disagreement? So, as um, Kenner explained earlier, we now move on to, to items nine and ten, but we do not have uh, officers here to present or to ask questions of. Uh, that is disappointing, particularly um, given that item 10 is flooding in, in, in Thurrock, January 2021, and Stamford um, was uh, really affected by that. I, I did want to discuss that here this evening. Um, and it's particularly disappointing, considering there does seem to be quite, quite a lot of seats available here um, for, for officers to attend. But we are where we are, and we will move on from those two items, 9 and 10, and into the uh, work program, item 11, which is on page 187. So I know, Kenna, um, you w was going to uh, talk us through briefing notes. I know you've already um, been, been through that, but do you want to just quickly go through that as a more general point? Thank you, Chair. So, um, as the Chair said, I mean, as members will see before you, there's a draft um, work programme that's obviously been brought together along with officers, just to give you a rough idea of, of uh, reports that could come uh, to committee. There was uh, last year a review into overview and scrutiny, and I'm sure many members may be aware of this. Uh, it went to Cabinet, and Cabinet agreed some of the recommendations that came out of that. Two of the main ones... Um, that I wish to discuss with you was, as I said uh, earlier, um, limiting the use of two-note reports, 
Um, the function of ONS is obviously due to get involved before the final decisions are made, due to look into things, scrutinise those decisions, and so sometimes um, those members that were on the review felt that noting reports wasn't always very helpful. Um, instead, it was suggested that um, more in-depth reports were therefore brought in front of you and the use of briefing notes were used a lot more. So, for example, if um, officers felt that a report was to come and it was merely just updating you on a subject, you could perhaps have a discussion on that or you could look at it and have no questions and it's almost a waste of your evening when you could have had a more in-depth report come and have a more in-depth conversation something that is going off to cabinet um so we're trying to limit those the use of those reports they could also be used um if we have big projects for example we've still got things like the a13 project going and uh stampedly hope with the, the train station you may feel that as they are big items that you're there's, you know, things can change quite quickly, things could, could change slowly, but there could be a situation where you are, there is a big update and, you know, you, want, you need that information a bit sooner. So then by the time we come to committee, you have a fuller report, but you'll have more information on the way. Um, we will, um, moving forward, have an item on the agenda for briefing notes. So if you are supplied briefing notes between, for example, now and the next meeting, and you think, well, that's all well and good, but we would pr prefer a fuller report, we can mention that there, we can bring that in, and we can schedule it under where you'd like that to be seen. Um, another thing that came out of the review was for um, projects. It may not be something that, um, as a committee, you don't feel you want to look into a project. Um, an example for this committee could perhaps be um, the local plan is a big item um, and at meetings it's not necessarily that you're going to have C updates very regularly so it could be that perhaps you choose that as a project but you get regular briefing notes rather than having it at every single meeting where you're going to get bigger updates you could have more frequent updates but you'll get the information a bit more soon and obviously a bit more timely um, and then that, that was all I really wanted to say. I'm happy for any questions, not if there's any items that members want added on the, on the work programme. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that, Kenna. The, the use of briefing notes is certainly uh, something uh, I'm interested in and support. Um, before we discuss items that members may wish to see on, on the uh, work programme going forward, does anyone have any comments or questions for Kenna on briefing notes or anything she's just said? Councillor Kerry. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, um, uh, what you said that reassured me is that a briefing note could turn into a report if we've um, if we're looking and think, oh, hang on a minute, you know, th there's more information needed here. And and you also said it wouldn't be replacing the reports. Like for example, I wouldn't want a briefing note for October instead of the full report on the A13, for example. You know, so but like you said, if these briefing notes will give us sort of nimbleness in, in between meetings, then yeah, I'm, I'm, the more information. You know, that, that's like I've always said, you know, that's our job to work hard and to scrutinise. So um, any briefing notes in between, but I'd still sort of, for the big projects like A13, Stanford, and really this, um, the, the inter, the, the Grey's underpass, I think um, we, we need them still regularly brought as full reports. Um, could I also ask about the um, proximity of PTR with Cabinet? Because even if we'd endorsed and did all the things we were going to do tonight, um, it, it gives less than, you know, 24 hours for Cabinet to take on board what we've said. So I wonder if we could look at a, a, an appropriate space so that, you know, we any comments or any recommendations we've changed or any anything we want brought up, that actually it has a chance to actually influence the Cabinet report that follows it because nothing we've said tonight would have changed because the, the Cabinet agenda is already published. You know, and um, just the other thing, like you said, I agree with you totally, Councillor, about um, about officers attending because tonight, although we've been sort of critical of the the report on the underpass, at least the officer is here present to face it and to answer for it, and I respect that. So um, I think it, even if teams had been working, I think now that I don't understand, we've all got to be here, and this is our right, and we, and right, you know, we are. We're here to represent, and I think we need officers here to defend the reports that that they present. 
because it's not fair that only three officers had to come and answer for our criticisms. You know, every, any, any officer who is involved in any of these reports should be here to, to face us, really. Uh, I'm in agreement with yourself, Councillor Kerrin, um, and I'm sure that's the sentiment of, of everyone on the committee. Uh, hopefully, as, as we go forward uh, out of July, um, we will be back in the Council, each and every one of us, uh, holding these meetings. Um, and, and just on uh, your point with regard to the proximity to uh, Cabinet, uh, obviously, uh, I understand that the, the Council holds a lot of meetings and so democratic services that have a job, um, uh, you know, f fitting everything in, but that's something I'll, I'll leave to um, Kenneth's capable hands. <laughs> um, do we have any comments uh, or requests uh, for actual items to appear on the work plan? This, Councillor Kerrin. Um, could we have an, an item brought updating us on um, the cycling and the tranche funding? I know Councillor Maney was due to present it at full council, but obviously technical difficulties, and it will be brought to the reconvene meeting. But then, following on from that, maybe a few a few meetings later, by the end of this municipal year, perhaps we could have an update so we can compare kind of what the portfolio holder says at full council and then have a report later on in the cycle to sort of compare what he said with how it's currently going. And because that was also, I remember, that, I think that was at PTR and I remember um, commenting on it and I, it just it isn't on here. So if we could, and that involves funding decisions, you know, so, and, and also an update once we find out what we've received or not received from the town's funds, that would be good to have at PTR so we can comment on that as well. Yep, certainly. I'm sure that will go uh, go on the work plan for, for some point for the end of the municipal year. Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we will obviously we'll have parking and uh, flooding come back at a later date. Um, yeah, I, I would have thought after July uh, all officers and, and ourselves will be present. So hopefully this will be the last time we're in that situation. Um, not sure if these can come, but I saw with the Paramount Park in Kent, I saw a lot of news. I saw a very ambitious idea of uh, maybe a tram network from, from there all the way through Furrock to Basildon. So I wondered if we could have that at a later date. I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying next meeting because I don't want to clog up the, the agenda too much, but maybe uh, if we could just have a briefing on, on what the sort of ideas and thoughts are on, on terms of that project going forward, because effectively it's going to be right on our doorstep even though it's, it's in Kent. And then I wanted to see if there was any updates on east facing slips. These are the, the, the junction from Lakeside. Should have been installed 30 years ago, but we are where we are, but I understand that is that is very close in, in terms of potential funding. So, if we could bring that here, or or if not, if we could have some form of, of update, that'd be great. Both both of those, uh, Councillor Kelly, are noted, um, and and as you say, they uh, can either uh, appear on the uh, agenda at another meeting, um, or it, it may well be that uh, we decide one uh, of those uh, items is is useful to have a brief note on and, uh, you know, updates of that nature. So. Excellent. So these briefing notes, these emails, they'll be sent out in email format, and I assume it'll be titled PTR briefing note subject. Yeah. So uh, what they'll do is we have a briefing note template, so it'll be a Word document, um, similar to front, I think, of a report, um, and they'll be emailed out to members, so they'll be full of information, but they will be one side of A4. It won't be like a full-on report, but it so, but you'll still have a document rather than just an email, but they can be circulated, obviously, a lot sooner. Chair, could I just confirm, if these are both of these reports, that Councillor Kelly has obviously suggested, if they're information reports, would you be happy with them both in the interim as briefing notes, but you get that update and then you can decide on a fuller report as a committee? Uh, Councillor Kerrin, did you have something um, to say? Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say actually, with the um, east facing slips, it, I, I remember it was last year that came up to um, PTR. That took up a, a lot of time. I think I'd be happy with a, 
a brief in note sort of quite quickly just to give us the headlines on it but I think in this minute as soon as Councillor Kelly said it it really sort of um, reminded me of when we last had it so I'd, I'd be happy I'd, I'd prefer if that if it started as a briefing note but became a report by the end of this municipal year because then we've covered um, you know the A13 Stanford the interchange the slips and um, also the the tranche funding as well. anything that involves like the funding and regeneration I think even if we have some bulkier agendas we're all I think we're all pretty good on this committee we'll we'll put the work in and stay however long it takes to really scrutinize it and you know I see you look there chair but I know you will if push comes to shove <laughs> have we got any further um comments from committee it does not look like it and so I shall close this evening's meeting of PTR. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance in person here this evening. And enjoy your evening.